guys, how's it going? <laughs> you enjoy the show? Yeah. How many of you remember the Phantom Theater ride? <laughs> okay, well, Kyle, to introduce our special guest. Yeah, so obviously the reason you guys are here today, uh, we have a special guest with us, uh, Rick Bashup of r, r Creative Amusement Designs. He is the man ultimately responsible for a very memorable, uh, a, a, an attraction that really told a well-rounded story. And uh, Rick, thank you so much for being here today, coming all the way from California. It's an honor for me to be here with you guys. Awesome. What do you think of the show? How true to the characters was it? The show was great. I've seen it on, uh, <coughs> I've seen it on YouTube. Uh, it's not like seeing it in person. Oh. Yeah, it's great. Let's get started with the questions. Some of the questions came from different things we'd seen over the last couple of weeks on social media and today when uh, uh, we put out that uh, Rick was going to be here. So Kyle, get started. Yeah, so Rick, how did you get started in the attraction industry with r, &R Creative and all that kind of stuff? Well, I, I'd always been interested in amusement parks. When I was a kid, I still have drawings and so forth that I did of rides and that. Uh, some of them look alarmingly close to some of the stuff I still do when I was eight years old, drawing rides and stuff. But uh, I got I had kind of a long road in the music business. I was actually a police officer for a while uh, and uh, ran into my partner, Richard Farron, and uh, he's a great artist. And uh, we started uh, making up some designs and building some models. And in those days, you could just go up to the door and ask Spray Farm or Six Flags and say, hey, look, we do something. And that's how we started. So we started designing from that. All right, tell us about R and R Creative Amusement Design. Uh, what do you do? Basically, the company is a, uh, a full design service. We don't do the architectural, uh, but we design safe, safe Phantom Theater from from the ground up. All the uh, renderings and so forth you see out there are things that we did and built the model, write the scripts and, and so forth. I create all the characters and write the scripts. It's part part of what I do with running the company. But actually, R and R is just two guys. And um, we like to keep it that way. I've worked with Universal Studios and a lot of parks and so forth along the way, but uh, I'd much rather keep it small because we can move real fast and get things done. So with the dark ride, you have very limited time to capture the audience, the guest's attention. You know, with each different scene, only they'll get to see seconds. So what, in your opinion, makes a great dark ride? I think a simple story, uh, we've done lots of dark rides along the road. We've done them on the East Coast, like the Exterminator at Kennywood, and of course the ride here, and, and so we've probably done a dozen dark rides along the road. Uh, and um, I think what makes a good, <laughs> a, a good dark ride is a story, and, and a real simple story. The Phantom Theater, the guys, you know, uh, they boarded up the theater, but they just wanted to keep hanging around and, and doing their act and so forth, and that's really the story. Uh, so I think a, a good dark ride, uh, has a nice simple story and has humor. And when I wrote this, uh, the story, and when I wrote about uh, these characters are created, these characters, it was really to have fun. Uh, you know, Maestro is kind of a uh, graspable kind of a guy, and he's kind of like, hey, what are you doing in my theater, kind of a thing. But uh, even with that, he still likes to have people come through. So uh, I think the characters seem to be likable and uh, have some fun with it. Now, how did you get connected, started with Kings Island uh, to design Phantom Theater? Uh, we met Kings Island at, uh, some of the people from Kings Island at the uh, IAPA show, which is the International Amusement Park Attraction Show, and that's held every year in various places now in Orlando. And uh, they uh, met us there and they contracted us to do the Adventure Express, if you've been ever been on the Adventure Express. <laughs> It's, uh, I was writing it today. I haven't written it in a long time. Uh, but uh, the uh, <coughs> Adventure Express was uh, something that we did for them here. And then when that Phantom Theater came up, then um, it wasn't the Phantom Theater. It was the Haunted Theater. It was, you know, wasn't what it is yet. But uh, after Adventure Express, then they contracted us to do the Phantom Theater. So, so, what was kind of the inspiration for Phantom Theater and, you know, you started working that probably in 1991, I assume, so what kind of inspired that? You know, I, I studied a lot of stuff and watched stuff about vaudeville, 
because that's really what it's about, is at the turn of the century, there wasn't really movies, and they didn't have a TV set in that, but people used to go to vaudeville shows, and it had acrobats, it had comedians, it had daredevils, magicians, all that kind of stuff. So uh, that was really my inspiration, was to study a lot of vaudeville, and then I created the characters, uh, kind of a goofy way, Houdini and the Garbanzo, the great Garbanzo, I'm sorry, I'm sure you can get his name. His name right, because he's back there and he's bigger than me. <laughs> Well, let's talk about those characters a little bit. When I was coming to the park as a season pass holder, writing Phantom Theater, I mean, I was just fascinated by all the different characters and their personalities. So, uh, kind of introduce us to, to what was behind each of the characters as you were creating them. Behind the characters? The characters, yes. Uh, well, I wanted to have a, a kind of a, a whole array palette of, of characters. So, uh, did you see the characters? He'll, he'll the bovine. I called her bovine, but he calls her bovine. Uh, so that's cool. It sounded like bovine better. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to get a complete palette of different kind of personalities. And uh, again, all kind of fun and all kind of goofy and having fun and, and enjoying what they do and kind of spooky. Uh, and that's uh, you know, the way I wrote it. So what, take us through the design and storyboarding process. Kind of what, what did that look like? What did that entail? Well, essentially that starts off with a, a layout. And we have to take the layout of the ride and start figuring out how much space is where. And uh, the sight lines in that, and as the cars turn and that, there's a lot of gold in that. Uh, but uh, taking it through there, uh, the next step would be to start doing storyboards. And I was working and creating the characters. Um, I've got a couple of great artists who work with us and they would do refining and so forth. But I sit down and, and design the characters and the scripts and their personalities. And each one has a different personality. So uh, basically that's the process of getting at the start. Once that's approved, uh, then we go into actual blueprinting, uh, uh, laying out the sets, picking out the colors, designing the lighting, uh, designing the audio systems, uh, recording all the voices, doing the scripts for the voices, recording all the voices. Uh, the next step was starting to put it all together. We had people bidding on the animatronic characters that were in there, and once the uh, once the people are, uh, are, are sorry, the, the companies uh, have gotten uh, their bids, you know, to us and to the to the park owners. Um, at that point, the person or the people are picked out to do the sets and, and the uh, characters and so forth. And so from there, I wanted to start building it, you know. And, uh, on Phantom Theater, um, I did all the lighting myself. That was in the old days before they had all this, you know, all the computer stuff, and uh, you know, be up on a ladder cutting gels and putting them in the, in the lights and that. So that, that way was a lot of fun, actually. And I was doing that about 10 minutes before the ride opened. And, uh, <laughs> and I was still up you know, trying to get Garbanzo just right. And uh, you know, we'd kind of get out of the car when they first, when they first came through. Uh, but uh, that's basically the process goes through. But uh, I have to say, with our company, most companies who do anything like this have got a lot of people involved. I did uh, Jaws at Universal uh, in Florida, and uh, we did a lot of that, a lot of that ride. And uh, we would go in. I, I worked on uh, King Kong and some other things there along the road. But uh, we would go in, and there'd be 18 or 20 people sitting there arguing about every detail, and uh, that was the, for us was difficult to deal with because I'm just used to sit down and go, "Here it is. This is great. And if that's the color it is, let's go." Let's do it. So I, I believe to be creative, you don't need to have a huge amount of people working on stuff. And maybe you've seen the model that's on display out in the lobby out there. <laughs> How involved with that model is maybe being uh, you know, some kind of uh, inspiration or some kind of a guideline when we're building this attraction? Uh, that particular model is uh, more of a, uh, a design and build model. That, uh, we, we do some, some other models that are like really meticulous, three-dimensional carved and that kind of thing, and that's a, a presentation model. But uh, this model here, we used it uh, basically so you can see the uh, spaces and as they built it, understand how things come together and what the sight lines are and so forth. So uh, I, it was amazing to me that it survived. And it's, still, it's still here and survived. Awesome. So, the music composed for the ride itself is, is quite iconic, and it's definitely like an earworm, you know, I, I, I hear it everywhere. 
And uh, there's, you know, four, it's com uh, chopped up into essentially four uh, different parts of the song. Right. How was how was that kind of composed? What, what was the what was the design process behind that? Well, we had a guy that uh, Kevin Nato is is still around, and uh, he had been doing some uh, producing uh, or production of music for us. Uh, we we're doing the MGM theme park. If any of you ever got to see that in Las Vegas. And uh, he did a lot of music for us there. But uh, we just sit down and start playing around with some different themes and that, and get some inspiration from some moody things and so forth. And so, we, you know, uh, it does build upon itself. It plays on one level, and then as it goes into the next scene area, it kicks up, and then it, as it goes further on, and it goes into the uh, boiler room and all that, uh, and the prop room, then it's a, it's a different theme. So. Uh, music is like really critically important. You see, when you know these guys are doing this stuff up here, what the what the difference of music makes. So, uh, we're big advocates of uh, music and, and you know original music that we do. It. Awesome. All right, show of hands out there if the maestro is your favorite character. <laughs> All right, what is it about the maestro that makes him stand out? Well, you know, he's he's, he's a, kind of a grouchy character, but yet he's still. <laughs> He's, you know, he's like, you know, what do you come to see? Why are you here? What are you looking for? Uh, but uh, still, he kind of enjoys people coming through. But he's the boss, and he runs everything. The other guys, you know, they're having fun doing their acts and breaking glass and pull a rabbit out of a hat and that. But, uh, uh, you know, Maestro is kind of the key character. He shows up in the ride, you know, three different times, and he's in the queue line entertaining. Uh, so, uh, you know, he's really the premium character you can see. Everybody saw that when they created the play here. Um, but uh, my favorite is Garbanzo. I just like the great girl. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. So um, behind, you know, Maestro is uh, a recognizable voice, actually. Um, how did Hollywood actor Richard Doyle come into, uh, how, did, how did he get that, that process? Uh, Richard Doyle is a, you know, one, of, one of my best friends. We've been working with him for 30 years. And uh, if anybody ever saw it, Cheers, it's a long time ago. You probably see it in reruns. Cheers, he was a regular on Cheers. He was Woody's girlfriend's father for a while. Uh, he's an actor. He was in Air Force One and, and various movies and stuff. But mostly he's a stage actor and a voiceover guy. So I've used him from the start. He's amazing. I could, I could say, I want this accent. I want this. Um, kind of attitude and so forth. So we develop like with my show, you know, we look at the pictures, we get in the studio, he tries some different things and we go for it. And uh, actually almost all the voices in Phantom Theater, I don't usually tell people that because I'm one of the think there's 18 people recording, but uh, Richard Doyle does almost all the voices, including the Usher, uh, including, uh, not Hilda Bovine. Uh, I do a couple of the characters myself, like the mummy. Ooh. The hard stuff. But, uh, no, it's war. But uh, uh, he's, you know, he's a great actor, and I got a hold of him on this, and he uh, collaborated, and we got the scripts, and, and so the voicing that you hear when people leave the theater or when they're getting announcements out there are brand new. Uh, and we went back through and just kind of researched the character out because it's been a few years since he did it, and it, uh, it's, it's difficult. The gentleman who does it here, it's very difficult because he's, you know, I mean, he's high, he's, he's, he's shrill and all that, but still not obnoxious, just kind of towards that way, right? But uh, anyway, Richard has been kind of the voice of R&R &R for forever. He does pirates for me and animals and I don't know, whatever, whatever it might be. And he's just an amazing guy. He did the, the Usher, a completely different voice than, than Maestro. He does cartoons and things like that, but uh, he's a big part of our... Uh, of our team. He's a contract guy, but he's part of a team when I need him. Awesome. A lot of times when uh, attractions are being designed, other companies get involved a little bit, you know, to help out here and there with things. Did that happen with Phantom Theater? Uh, well, of course, the, uh, the conveyance system, which is what you ride in, was done by uh, uh, Dana Morgan, who's a good friend of ours, and uh, his dad uh, worked for Arrow. And, uh, Actually, Arrow, the Adventure Express coaster, is the last coaster that Arrow did, the steel coaster, before they went out of business. Uh, but Dana Morgan did the conveyance system. Uh, AVG is the company that did the animatronics for us. Uh, and 
beyond that, it was mostly a lot of people from the park event who worked and worked with us and, and, uh, and did it. But it's always kind of a collaborative, collaborative effect. But uh, you know, the most fun is being out on, on site and set. And uh, when we opened Phantom Theater, my mom and dad came from California to see it. And uh, they would have been really excited to see this. They're gone now. But uh, it would have been very exciting for them to see this. They just loved the ride and rode it over and over again. And so forth. But anyway, I'm going off track. Uh, there's various companies that do have to come together, but <laughs> the less companies I can bring together, the easier it is. You know, to keep things simple, I assume. So, with a new ride comes uh, typically, you know, we got to fi uh, fix a couple things and tweaks, some tweaking. Uh, what are some of the challenges faced when uh, you know, opening Phantom Theater? Uh, actually, the lighting on this was kind of tough because we had all kinds of illusions, like the scrims that would turn the scrims be We have seen the uh, the poster and then the character shows up behind. Some of those things were were, uh, were difficult lighting wise, and to keep it a dimmed environment with lights going off and on and that. But uh, you know that's challenging, and it's always challenging put, to put the music in properly. We can hear it or hear the voices uh, to write the scripts so that you, you know it isn't too complicated. You understand what they're talking about. As you go by, but uh, you know, there's a lot of challenges to put it together. But it's it's art and science put together, more art than science actually. One of my favorite scenes was the theater scene in Phantom Theater. How did you go about creating the ghost effect? The ghost effect in uh, the theater scene. Um, I'm trying to think, what ghost effect? Uh, Pepper's ghost. Pepper's ghost. Oh, okay, all right, the Pepper's ghost. Uh, that was one thing when, when we first worked with Kings Island here about doing a dark ride and they wanted to do something that was spooky but they wanted towards the, the, uh, the haunted mansion without copying it. Uh, but uh, the one thing they did want to have is the what's called the Pepper's Ghost Illusion, which I'm sure you've all been to Disneyland and seen the, uh, the banquet scene where everybody's uh, eating and so forth. Well, what that is is you're looking at glass and the characters are actually behind you, and they're lit up. When they're lit up, they're reflecting in glass over there. So that was a, a challenge, and they wanted that, which was the theater performance. Once we got into Garbanzo shooting himself out of the can and then hitting the wall with his feet sticking out, some of my favorite uh, effects there. But that's what's called the Pepper's Ghost, and, and it's been around since before Vaudevillian. Uh, even before electric uh, lights, they, they did that, because if you look out your window and, and, and you're lit up inside, look at the window and you can see yourself. You look like you're looking inside. So that's what that is. But it's very tricky to pull off uh, properly. And we had massive glass to, to do that. But the characters are actually uh, up overhead, behind you, and underneath. So there wasn't anything in the middle where you were traveling, but they were over and, and under. So it was, a, you know, it, was a, it was a great illusion, but uh, it's tricky to pull off. Yeah, no, it was a very impressive scene. You had um, you had uh, the great Hunalini floating on top, uh, Hilda Bovine or Bovine uh, singing from the top, uh, Maestro down playing the organ. You had Garbanzo shooting himself out of cannon, and it was cool because you know you would see Garbanzo in the cannon illuminated, but then it would illuminate his feet as he had crashed into the side of the theater. So it was a very very impressive effect. Um, so, were there any ideas that didn't make it to the final product of Phantom Theater? I had to think about it. Um, you know, not particularly. <laughs> I think almost everything that, that you see there, uh, and just look at the storyboards out there, our original storyboards, basically everything was pretty well in there the way we you know, originally uh, created it and concepted it out. But I'll tell you, there's a, a secret in there, and that is that. There's a character that you never see. Does anybody know what it is? Bosco! Bosco, right? The Mighty Bosco. Okay. Now, the Mighty Bosco, he's a guy that is behind the door, and he's so big that his hands are trying to push, push the door open. Uh, but if he's the Mighty Bosco, why can't he open his door? I don't know. But he is a character, and uh, we would do something here again with uh, Phantom Theater. He, You'll find out who he is, but right now, only I know who he is and what he does. <laughs> Phantom Theater gave over 14 million rides during its years of operation here. When you look back, uh, what are you and your team most proud of with that attraction? Well, this. 
you know, <laughs> the, leg, the legacy. Uh, uh, It's emotional to see people looking at things that basically I, I created 30 years ago and, and, and are still strong enough to survive and entertain people and uh, that's, you know, that's really, for me, you know, to still be involved with this and be with the park, you know, on, on something that powerful, it's, uh, you know, it's an honor really. So I, I thank all of you for being the fans. <laughs> It's great to see, you know, the legacy kind of taking a life or, or afterlife of its own. Um, had to get that in there. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what was, what do you think your favorite, did you have a favorite scene from Phantom Theater? Or, so I know you said your favorite character was Garbanzo. What, did you have a favorite scene of the 17 or 18 different scenes? Um, you know what, I, I couldn't really say what would be my favorite scene because we're trying to make everyone as powerful as, as we can, you know, and the boiler guys at, at the end, you know, how about some heat, you know, um, is, is, uh, is powerful and, and uh, I really have to say there's nothing, I like Garbanzo the best, uh, I always wanted him to blow me up at the end and uh, but we kind of ran out of room with the boiler room there. Okay, so it was 30 years ago when Phantom Theater opened, 20 years ago when it closed, in fact, tomorrow, fun fact. Tomorrow was the day that it gave its last rides, right? Yep, so I knew you would know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, why do you think an attraction, in, you know, so it's been 20 years since anyone last experienced it, why does it still resonate with guests today? You know, uh, it's hard to brag about it in, my, in, my, in myself, but, uh, you know, I think because it was funny, it was a little spooky, um, it had different kinds of characters, and it was just fun. Uh, and it was kind of a little spooky fun, but it was, it was fun. So I, I, to me, that's, that's the reason you know, I survived. That's the way I designed it from the start. So yeah, I guess it worked. So, um, lost it. Um, if, so say if, you know, Phantom Theater, um, you hadn't done Phantom Theater, you know, 30 years ago, and you were, it, you were contracted to make it, you know, today and today with today's technology and stuff. You know, what would you do differently? Well, there's a lot of a, lo a lot of technology out there uh, that uh, you can utilize in something like this. Now there's projections and a lot of things, but I wouldn't change it a whole lot because they're like they're like real. You know, I mean, I would change the story maybe. Um, I would take. Okay, here's, here's my new ending, okay? I'll, I'll let you know the secret. Here's my new ending, okay? So we take the boiler, we take the guys with the boiler room and we move them a little bit forward and they blast you with heat as you come through. But you come around the corner. As you come around the corner, there's Maestro. And Maestro has got his, uh, his cape in front of him and he's giving you kind of the last talk. Like, well, did you see what you wanted to see, right? Okay, well, at that time, um, the great Garbanzo pops up out of a box with a dynamite lit, right? And so uh, now Maestro looks at him and goes, what are you doing here? And I'm, boom, he blows, uh, Garbanzo blows the whole place up. Bam, 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 okay? And then he pops down, but now he pops back up and he's all blown up, okay? So that's, that would be the way I would, I would end it now. So, uh, but I still keep the boiler guys because everybody likes that heat, that blast of heat, right? Uh, so there's, you know, it, it, it's hard to say it was what it was when we did it. If we redid it now in some way, um, you know, we use a lot of what worked and, and a lot of new technology in that. But without going overboard, technology, you can't let technology run the show. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a tool, it's a tool, but if you become aware of the technology, that's really not a good tool. And if you overdo it, it's not a good tool. So it's, it's you know. It's staying up with the times. Uh, you know, you do LED lighting, which is a lot easier than putting the gels in. But putting the gels in was a lot of fun. So I was doing that. Any kind of uh, you know stories or fun facts about Phantom Theater that uh, it's not commonly known that you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, well, I, I I was telling you the story about the mighty Bosco, which he's still lurking out there. Which you know nobody really knows but me who he is and what he does. But. Uh, Maybe someday, who knows? We'll 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 bring them back. But uh, uh, no, there's no. Uh, 
something that I would, I would bring up right now. Okay. Uh, tell them the story about um, the, uh, the props that you guys got for the props room. How did those come about? <laughs> well, what we did was, uh, in the prop room, we had a lot of, of, of pictures and, and things hanging on the wall and that, you know, as a prop room would. So what we did was uh, we used to get the Kings Island credit card and we would go to antique shops in uh, Cincinnati. And some of them were really strange. They were like the Phantom Theater. You go down these, they'd say, hey, come down. We got something down here for you. Say, okay. So we go down into the basement and we're picking out pictures and that. So all of that stuff was picked up from uh, local places. And we did have a bunch of pictures that had a rounded glass, like they used to do way, way back when, and then over it, it was a rounded glass. Well, I put those in, as soon as I did, they would, all the lights were reflecting off the rounded glass everywhere. So we had to take all the rounded glass off and just leave it like that. But, you know, Cincinnati, uh, uh, the city of Cincinnati, uh, contributed to that, because that's where we found all the kind of strange uh, things that were hanging on the wall. We use that in the gallery and a lot of places like that. What were your thoughts when you heard Kings Island was going to do a stage show for Phantom Theater? They were going to replace it? Uh, well, what can you say? No, I don't want that to happen, but <laughs> it did. So, uh, you know, I guess we put a lot of love and respect in, in, in that, into the, uh, into that, uh, into that ride, like every ride we do. But uh, this one was one of the very special ones that we've done over the last 40 years, I guess. We've been doing it. I tell people I started when I was eight, but, uh, We've been doing, uh, you know, rides for, for a long time. And uh, that, uh, you know, it's sad to see something go, but in show business, things come and go sometimes. And, you know, dark rides and, and that particularly will last for 20 years, maybe, or something. Come and go. Something new is put in. Yes. So now it's returned in Phantom Theater on board. Yes, when you so first heard about was, it. Yeah, so when you, you know, I know we had, Paul from Cedar Fair Planning and Design, and you know we did a blog on the Kings Island blog, and you know there's a POV now on Kings Island's YouTube you can check out. Um, what were kind of thoughts when you first heard like you know this is kind of it's coming back in a different way? Well, I was I was amazed when I heard about it. And people started getting a hold of me and say, hey, see what's going on, and then Paul got a hold of me and then we went from there. But yeah, it was it, you know it was a great honor to see that people haven't forgotten these characters and the ride and. And that it's, it was so powerful, actually, and, and entertaining that you know it turned into into this. And who knows? Who knows what the next step is on the thing, right? <laughs> you see the show. So when you're out in the audience, you're watching. You know what was it like to, to see your creations, you know, on the stage, and how true to the characters do you think they are? I uh, I, I I first saw it. My wife and I sat and we're, we're watching on the computer. I'm going, I can't believe this. There's, Gar there's Garbanzo, there's all my characters, you know? And, uh, you know, obviously we, we want to come out here and, and see it live. And they did a fantastic production of it and they captured the, uh, you know, the voices and they, you know, they just really captured it and turned it into a lot of fun. Uh, the, uh, the Usher's become a real popular character all along the road where it was just one of the guys there, but uh, obviously you can see the comic. Uh, possibilities of him that they've utilized on the show, but uh, you know, I just think they've done a great job and it's a great honor you know, to me to be here and see it and, and meet the cast. And